Warning, the Thin Blue Line podcast, Harry Bosch, contains adult content. Harry and others use profanity, adult language, and discuss adult topics, and so shall we. One more warning, this podcast may contain spoilers. I must stress this for this chapter and the entire podcast, so please proceed with extreme caution. Last two things before you begin your deliberations. First, I want you to remember that both sides had the opportunity to present a full and complete case. In Norman Church's behalf, we have his wife, a co-worker, a friend, stand up and testify to his character, to what kind of man he was. Yet the defense chose to have only one witness to testify before you, Detective Bosch. No one else stood up for Detective Objection, Belk yelled. Bosch, hold it right there, Miss Chandler, Judge Keys boomed. The judge's face became very red as he thought about how to proceed. I should clear the jury out of here before I do what I'm going to do. But I think if you're going to play with fire, you should accept the burns. Hello, and welcome to the Thin Blue Line podcast. I'm Philip Parker, a retired detective with over 29 years of law enforcement experience. Please subscribe to our podcast on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And please rate us five stars or better. Please follow us on Twitter at The Thin Blue Line Pod and our Facebook and Instagram pages, which are set up just for our fans. Also, join us at www.thethinbluelinepod.com for more investigative content where you will find a more detailed experience concerning Harry Bosch and Michael Connolly. Now all that's out of the way, it's time to get back to work and probe into chapters 21 through 24 of The Concrete Blonde. Last time on the Thin Blue Line podcast, we explored how Breaking Someone's Trust Shape chapters 17 through 20 of The Concrete Blonde. And today we will be taking a deep dive into chapters 21 through 24. As always, there's the prerequisite spoiler alert. It's my intention to stay away from spoilers, but sometimes shit happens. So please proceed with extreme caution. And now, the Thin Blue Line podcast, Harry Bosch. It's time to open up the murder book and turn the page to the chronological record so we can do an investigative summary on the information gathered thus far in this chapter. Bosch gets into his car at Parker Center, puts his key in the ignition, but doesn't start the car. He contemplates going inside for coffee before leaving or even maybe staying at a couch inside but the urge to see Sylvia is stronger. Instead, Boss dozes off, a rookie assigned to watch the lot, knocks on his window to check and see if he's okay. The 30-minute nap was just enough to refresh him. Harry drives to Sylvia's and goes in quietly. Sylvia is already in bed. She says hello and asks him where he's been, and he realizes how lucky he feels to have her. After a quick shower, Harry and Sylvia make love, after which Harry and Sylvia profess love for each other. Harry tells Sylvia that she has to accept him without his past, but comes to realize that Sylvia would need to know that past life to build a future relationship. At court the next day, Belk is unimpressed when he sees Bosch rumpled and wearing the same clothes from the day before. Bosch goes out for a quick smoke, and Chandler's also there. He tells her that he wants to note that she was sent. The look on Chandler's face confirms his theory that the follower also sent her a note. Bosch reminds Chandler that withholding evidence in itself is a crime, and if necessary, he will get a warrant. Chandler recovers quickly, telling
telling Bosch that the judge would never grant a warrant for her home under the circumstances. Bosch smiles and thanks her for telling her where the note is. Chandler is rattled, and Bosch also tells her that he knows of her arrangements with Edgar. Back in court, Chandler is held in contempt concerning inappropriate statements made to the jury during her closing. The jury is sent off for deliberations, and Keyes orders everyone to be no further than 15 minutes away from the court. Harry heads to Parker Center in the conference room, which is now dubbed the Followers Task Force Working Area. Rollenberger and Edgar are the only ones there, and Edgar busies himself on the phone. Rollenberger fills Harry in on the little developments there are, and Harry follows Edgar out to get coffee. In the stairwell, Harry tells Edgar if he hasn't already approached Pounds, he shouldn't bother. Edgar is suspicious at first, and then relieved when he realizes Bosch is serious. Bosch receives a page from Moore, who advises him that he has found four more women that meet the same profile as the concrete blonde. Harry drives out to the University of Southern California to see Dr. Locke. He finds the psychological building and gets directions to the basement where Dr. Locke has his offices. Harry tells Dr. Locke about the four women identified as possible victims and Locke is excited by the prospect that the killer appears to be due to strike at any time. Locke asks Harry if he can join him on a stakeout, citing how it would be his ticket out of the dungeon offices. But Harry discourages this. Dr. Locke further advises that the follower will want to keep trophies of the prior murders. As Boss leaves the university, he purchases a book authored by Dr. Locke concerning pornography. And that gets us to this episode's big idea. So let's lift up the yellow tape and examine the clues. For the defining theme for chapters 21 through 24 is, forgiveness is not something that we do for other people. It's something we do for ourselves to move on. Hello, and welcome back to the Thin Blue Line podcast. Harry Bosch. We start today's episode off with that deciding to drive, or or let me back up a little bit. Listeners, your boy here, I'm the designated, I'm the DD. I usually never get uh, drink alcohol. I'm the boring one who everyone hands the keys to when you drive, when we go out somewhere. As you remember from last podcast, he gets dropped off at Parker Center um, by Bremer. And he's in the car and he decides, you know, he's making a decision, well, should I go inside to get some coffee or there's a cot in there, I should go just go sleep it off. But he's fighting the urge to go see Sylvia. And before he knows it, he falls asleep. And now Michael Conley puts this in Harry's world when Harry has this urge to go see Sylvia. I mean, think about it. He just got kicked in the balls about Edgar and he felt betrayed and he wanted to go to a safe space. This whole Sylvia is, to me, the the epitome of what a police officer or law enforcement officer significant other represents. And to have that place, that home, he said he wanted to go home to Sylvia. You start to see Harry opening up a little bit more towards Sylvia. And from prior books, we see that Harry identifies himself as a loner. You know, let's just go back to the Black Echo when Bosch saw the uh, f- the um, portrait of um, the Nighthawks, you know, the Edward Hopper's piece. And Bosch said, you know, back then, you know, he identified with the first, the first man, the loner. He thought, am I the Nighthawk? So now you got the Nighthawk having this urge to go with home to Sylvia. And we're starting to see a little transformation from Bosch, of Bosch, from being this lonely guy, this lonely detective. Now he's having urges to go to see Sylvia. And to me, again, I've said it throughout this podcast, I have been fortunate for the majority of my career to have um, a significant other who I, you know, especially after a tough day, 
yearn to go home to and just kind of feel safe. And, you know, Bosch does a lot of self-reflection. He keeps asking himself his motives. You know, he goes back over his actions. You know, quote, unquote, do I have the black heart? Now, I've seen what I consider people who have the black heart. I've interviewed individuals who have done some horrendous things. And, you know, it's always someone else's fault. It's never their fault. So if you have someone who's always reevaluating or have, have the courage to do self-reflection and possibly put themselves, you know, to question their motives, that's a person who does not, who's opposite of having a black heart. And, you know, again, Michael Connolly puts the reader into something that, again, I identify with. As you remember at the beginning of this podcast, I gave you, I gave you an example of an individual who I almost shot. And I didn't shoot him, shoot the individual. But just like my, um, Harry Bosch here, he can remember Norman Church's eyes, even though he can't remember his mother's face. And I can tell you right now, that individual who I spoke about earlier uh, in episode one of this podcast, I can still remember that guy's eyes. I remember that look in his eyes. I remember him looking at me, seeing that he was just about to get killed. And again, I never, I didn't, I didn't shoot the individual. But when Michael Connolly writes that Harry can remember Norman Church's eyes, I definitely can identify with that. And, you know, we also see Harry doing a reflection on his treatment of Edgar. And he makes, you know, he questions his, what he did. He questions, did he do the right thing by demanding Edgar leave um, the Hollywood station? Should he put this one um, in the back in his pocket and just say, you know, no harm, no foul? And he says to himself, you know, Edgar, he's going to have to make a decision concerning Edgar really quickly. Again, as I said last podcast, I, it, it was a blow to me, and I am so pissed off right now with Edgar. And I felt that again. You know, it's, it's, it's incredible what Michael Connolly's, what he does with these books, because based on my little bit of knowledge, books supposed to elicit some type of emotions. Um, that's why we keep reading them, right? And so my emotions here, I'm still pissed off at Edgar. But I kind of think Harry is right. It, it, me as a cop, if you look back over the totality of what happened, did Edgar fuck him? Yes, he did. But no harm, no foul. No one died. Maybe I might need Edgar in the past, I mean, in the future. And that's a calculation that um, Harry is going to have to, um, to come to grips with and make a decision with really quickly. And, you know, as he reflected on Bosch's drive back to Sylvia's, he looked at, uh, he said he was driving through the Kawanga Pass, and he looked up on the hilltop at a darkened house to try to see his house, and he couldn't. And he was glad he was going to Sylvia's. Again, I... Michael Connelly is just one hell of a writer. Again, well, because I keep reading the books, and so I'm going to keep saying that. And we get, now have Harry arriving at Sylvia's place, and then um, this passage from the book just stood out for me. He stood in complete darkness, letting his eyes adjust. Hi, she said from the bed, though he couldn't see her yet. Lo, where you been, Harry? She said it sweetly, with sleep in her voice, not a challenge or a demand. And as a cop, that right there just, again, sums up how special Sylvia is as a police officer's um, special or police officer's significant other. Again, it wasn't a challenge. It wasn't, where the fuck have you been? And again, I told you, I give you, I gave you many examples of that, you know, I had female informants, a female um, partner, very close to my, my, my female partners. And again, p- 
people, females would call me at all times of day, night, and I would talk to them. And it takes a strong partner to trust our relationship that I'm doing my job opposed to I'm stepping out on them. And again, we see it here with that, that comment, at least that Michael was conveying that sweetness. It wasn't a challenge or demand that she just asked, you know, where you've been. And that right there is a, is a quick snapshot of what I mean by that. Trust. And I say it, I've been saying it for the last three books. Um, I, one of the things I'm going to ask Michael Conley, did he write romance novels before? Because he really captures, and again, like you said, I'm, it's not that type of podcast, but he really captures a very romantic and intimate scene with Harry and Sylvia. And his, again, I guess if he wanted to, he might have a, um, a career in writing romance novels. <laughs> and, you know, Harry admitted to Sylvia that he was glad that she showed up to court. And again, I said that last podcast, and I know I would have been happy that my, my um, wife would have been there, even though I had insisted, don't show up, don't do this, don't do that. I don't want you to da 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 whatever. The fact of the matter, Harry did tell her it was special that she showed up to court anyway. And we're going to cover this more during the question of the day. But we also see Harry making the decision that he's going to stop Edgar from uh, transferring. And even so, again, we'll talk about it more during the question of the day. So let's move on. And so when Sylvia's kind of questioning Harry a little bit about the betrayal. Something that Michael Connolly writes in the book, again, just captures and just keeps putting more, giving you more examples of a true cop's wife from the book. No, whatever damage there is, it's already been done. I only figured out it was him tonight. It was by accident. Otherwise, I probably would have never even thought of him. Anyway, don't worry about it. She caressed his chest with her fingertips. If you're not worried, I'm not. He loved her knowing the boundaries of how much she could ask him and that she didn't even think to ask him who it was he was talking about. So let me tell you the importance of Sylvia not asking Harry who he was talking about because in a sense, Harry is protecting Sylvia. So if anyone ever comes by, behind Harry, to Sylvia and say, well, did he ever tell you about uh, a leak that was in the uh, department? And so she can honestly say, no, he, he never told me about who was the leak and or who it was. But she trusts him enough to know when he, when he said, when she said, if you're not worried, I'm not worried, it's done. But he opened up to her that this was on his heart. This was, this was what was bothering him. And again, it's that balance. And that's what I mean by a true law enforcement significant other. When you understand those boundaries that Harry didn't have to explain that delicate balance, the whole, well, baby, if I tell you this, then you're, you're liable or you could be questioned. I don't want to put you in that position to lie or something to that effect. He it's already understood. He didn't have to have that conversation with Sylvia. And that's what I mean. That's just another example of what I mean by Sylvia exemplifies what a true police officer's significant other represents. And that's why I like what Michael Conley's doing here. So brothers and sisters in a uh, law enforcement community, if you have a, uh, a husband, wife, significant other like Sylvia, as Harry Bosch would say, hold fast, hold fast. And, you know, after this uh, touching moment, we have a glimpse of Harry and Sylvia talking, because Sylvia asked him, is he really worried about what's going to happen in, in the trial the next day? And he makes an um, observation. He just doesn't want to be in the fishbowl. Um, he just getting, he's tired of people scrutinizing, you know, something he had to do in microseconds. And again, just to reiterate, I've never been in a civil trial, but I have been on the other side of sitting in a complaint, a citizen's complaint board. And, you know, to give it, Again, I'm talking about on a micro scale opposed to a civil trial, which is on a, on a bigger scale. But the department um, I'm from, 
before a person, before a citizen can be on the citizen review board, you know, to actually scrutinize actions of a police officer, we required or the union was able to fight to have the citizen to do a ride along with, with a street officer. And I'm not sure if they had to do it a day. I want to say a day. Let's just, just for argument's sake, let's just say for a day. And before we, we noticed, the union had noticed that before this requirement, conviction rates, I'm going to say, were astronomical, like officers being held accountable for some very minor uh, offenses. And what I mean by minor, because until, what's the old adage, until you walk a, um, a mile in my shoes, you don't understand me or something to that effect. I'm, I'm probably butchering that up. But having citizens ride along with officers and, officers and then have them sitting on the board kind of open their eyes to what these guys are subject to all the time. Again, how can you judge my actions without not understanding where I'm coming from? So then after we started tracking, after this requirement went in, the conviction rate plummeted because then the citizens were able to see, oh, well, wait a minute. I now understand what Officer A was talking about when he went to the scene and people were whatever, whatever. And then his actions were predicated off of that. And again, well, I told you I'm not going to say that anymore. Hold people accountable, but my goodness, could you please try to put yourself in my shoes when you are judging what I do? And, you know, I really am disappointed with my boy Harry here. Next um, interaction with him and Sylvia, because, you know, Sylvia pretty much asked him, what is he really worried about? Is the department going to do anything against him and all that kind of stuff? And. He's still holding back on Sylvia. And, and see, this is where I, you know, I know Harry's, it seems to be Harry's normal propensity. His go-to is not to share. But just two paragraphs ago, he talked about he's home. He's at home with Sylvia in her arms. She's caressing him. He, he loves and revels in the fact that she knew, knew what to ask, when to ask, how to ask it, and the boundaries. Well, come on, Harry, you're going to have to give up. And I don't know why. I wish, again, that's one of the things I want to ask Michael Conley. Why did he have Harry holding back here when it comes to not telling Sylvia about the interaction between himself and Chief Irving and the revelation that Irving was the reporting officer who found his mother? And, you know, upon reflection, maybe he didn't tell Sylvia about that because then that would lead into some of the, his past that he wants to hold from her. So. Again, um, that's my you know, initial thought, and I'm writing this down to um, bring up to Michael Conley if I have, ever have an opportunity to uh, interview him. And just, I, just as I said during the last podcast, Sylvia now is bringing up the fact of talking about his past. Remember, she told him, hey, right now, don't worry about it. Take care of your business while you're here in court. We'll talk about this aspect of our relationship later. But she brings it up, and then Harry says something that is kind of shocking, and I think he underestimates what Sylvia needs. And he said, again, from the book, you have to take me without my past. I let it go. I don't want to go back to examine it, to tell it, to even think about it. I spent my whole life getting away from my past. But we know he has it. You know, and I think that's naive of Harry to think about talking about his past. I mean, human nature, if you don't talk about and learn from your past, what well, they say you're doomed to repeat it. And then so shortly thereafter, Sylvia tells Harry that she loves him. And he admits that, you know, he told her back he loves her. And then he took on the weight of what that meant. And again, this balance, Michael Conley, it, it, I feel those skills, you know, coming around me, folks. Just let you know, I feel that Python skills coming around me. But in this, this chapter, the back and forth, the emotions just going back and forth. And again, that's why I like Michael Conley's writing, because it's not simple. I mean, that's, again, not just with the law enforcement, you know, everything's t- tidy and a nice bow and done in a half an hour. It also goes with the, pers- goes with the personal. Nothing is as tidy. And everything's messy with Harry, too. It's not so cut and dry. And, but Harry takes on the weight. He understands the weight of what he said. And he actually comes back and says later on, eh, 
maybe I'm going to have to talk about my past because I just took on the weight of telling this woman that I love her. And so then we have Harry going back to court. And in court, Belk, you know, is getting on him about um, his clothing and the manner he's dressed. And he pretty much tells Belk, I don't, I don't care. I don't care. And again, he says, why don't you care? He says, because I realize now there's more important things than 12 of my so-called peers, even if these peers wouldn't give me the time of day on the street. You know, it goes without saying that, remember, a lot of times the cops, we are interacting with people at their worst. And usually there is a victim and then there's a perpetrator. And it's, it, what he says here, what Harry says here, I got a lot of cops feel this way, that a lot of peers, once they find out, I've had people a visceral reaction when they found out I was a police officer. And they had this visceral reaction like, ugh, I thought you were a nice guy. Like, <laughs> what do you mean you think I was a nice guy? I'm, I, mean, I, I am a nice guy. Why well, can you be a cop and be a nice guy? Okay, I didn't think they were mutually exclusive. I thought, don't you want cops that are nice guys? And Again, these so-called people, once they found out, and you can see it. Again, a lot of cops can tell you. You can see it. Once people find out that you are a police officer, they treat you totally different. And they wouldn't even sometimes give you the time of day. And a lot of police officers don't even tell people that they are police officers. And there's a lot of reasons behind it. But that is one of the multiple reasons. Because like Harry says here, some of these quote-unquote peers wouldn't even give me a time of day on the street. And what I like what happens next is what Michael Connelly does with his um, Bosch's interaction with Chandler. So after Belk and Bosch talk, Bosch goes out for a smoke break and Chandler's already out there. And Bosch said he had time to think about it. And now Chandler is, is, is now he's going to try to play Chandler. Now, remember, Chandler has been playing him like a fiddle. She's been manipulating and using all her resources because the courtroom is her playground. She knows it. But outside the courtroom is Harry's playground. So then we see Harry saying pretty much, okay, now you're in my realm and I'm going to play you. And I love how he just comes out to her and says, I want the note. <laughs> Again, a forceful statement. I know about the note. Not if you got the note. No, I know about the note. Because he thought about it. Again, working it over and over again. Like I said just a little while ago, it's like a loose tooth or something that's in your it, um, or something um, that you just keep picking at a scab, be like, I can't let it go. And he was thinking after putting it together, Edgar said that Chandler had called him talking about the note. And so if Edgar didn't tell her about the note, someone else must have told her about the note. And it wasn't Brimmer because Brimmer's newspaper article said that Chandler was unavailable for comment. So how the hell did Chandler get information about this freaking note? The very first note, concerning the concrete blonde. And he put it together. The follower must have sent her a note too. And the fact, I, mean, that, I love that tactic. Again, good investigators, you, you switch things up. We're trained observers and you look for the little nuances. Uh, you know, you've already been working with this particular person or interacting with this particular person and you build, you, you build a baseline. And then when you hit them with something new, you see if they follow that baseline or if they change. And she changed. She flinched. But she, again, Chandler's good. She comes back really quick and gets her, gets, gets her footing and says, I don't know what you're talking about. And then, you know, Bosch has her make a couple of different uh, mistakes here. You know, you know, one is the fact that, you know, Harry said, hey, look, I'll get a warrant for you. And, he, and she goes, I'd like to see some judge in this town give you a warrant for my house. And Harry goes, well, thank you for letting me know where the warrant is. And then, two, you know, she even slips to the point of, well, the, pretty much inferred that the note is no different than the one that was bought in court. Again, Harry's like, how do you know that without there actually being a note? And again, he said it as she walked away. You know, hopefully that would, you know, uh, throw her off her game a little bit. And, you know, then, to add icing on the cake, Bosch says to her, you know, hey, I know about the arrangement between you and Edgar. And this right here, this here is another example of my admonition to any law enforcement personnel. Because Chandler goes on this, on this riff, and she also talks about her quote-unquote arrangement with Edgar, that he agreed to everything about their arrangement. And 
as Boss said later on, he doubted anything that Edgar was the one. Oh, then she also says, and matter of fact, he's the one who suggested the arrangement. And again, I believe Edgar. When Edgar said, you know, pretty much it was her idea, she called him. And then she made arrangements about money. And she didn't, what, like Edgar said, one, he sold himself for one month's rent or mortgage. And two, she never even paid him. But here's the last, or, last thing. When confronted, she throws it back on Edgar. So then you say, as a law enforcement personnel, was it worth it? Was it worth it? And even Harry says, you know, to um, Sylvia, you know, that Edgar betrayed, him, betrayed himself. That Edgar bet, um, betrayed himself. And maybe that was punishment enough. So, again, just to drive the point home, law enforcement guys, it's not worth it. Whatever the situation you're in right now, it can be markedly worse if you sell yourself out. Because just like in the black ice, once you cross that line, there's no crossing back. So back in court, we have Chandler you know, doing her closing argument, calls Boss a killer. And he kept, you know, you know, tumbling that over and over in his head. Killer, killer. Was he a killer? Was he a monster? And then he says to himself, now, you know what? I do care. I do care what this jury thinks. I want them to sanction what I did and why I did it. Because Chandler makes a good point. She says, law enforcement is supposed to mirror us as society. And do we want people like Harry Bosch as a cop? Now, you know, my answer to that is, hell yeah, I want people, I want cops like Harry Bosch. But Harry says to himself, I think I do care. I think I do want the jury to sanction what I did, that I'm no killer. And I can tell you right now, when I did, when I investigated cases, I always thought, okay, would the citizens approve of what I did? You know, when I present my evidence to them, are they going to say, God damn it, this detective, I like what he's doing. He's out here doing these type of cases and protecting us and blah, 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 and all that kind of stuff. So again, that's on a micro, a micro scale. So I get what Bosch is saying where he wants the jury to sanction and or approve of what he did. And, you know, it's, it's sad to say, but I have been on when I was at the prosecution table and I was with a particular a, um, U.S. attorney or attorney for the government. And the attorney did not have it, just didn't seem in it. Their closing arguments, the whole trial presentment was very technical, but there was no passion behind it. And most of the time, the, the opening and closing arguments are pretty theatric. You know, at least, again, in my opinion, that there's a lot of theatrics that go on. And we see here Belk had a lot of technical skills when it comes to what Harry did and how he did it. And again, I think Harry even said it, you know, Belk called him a hero. But Belk did do some things right. You know, that Harry went in because he thought it was a victim. Again, I talked about it before, especially nowadays. The citizens want cops to be proactive in their approach for something, not reactive, waiting to amass a, a bunch of different police officers and then think about the strategy to go on and before you go in. Citizens want cops to be proactive. That comes at a cost, citizens. It comes at a cost. And when the cops are being proactive, you got to give them some leeway where they're proactive in policy or where they're proactive with the right intent. And again, we see here, Harry explained it. I'm, I was being proactive. I didn't wait for backup because I thought it was another victim that was in there. We then see Honey Chandler cross the line and make some inflammatory and very derogatory and inappropriate statements concerning Bosch and, the, and being a defendant and no one, quote unquote, showed up to, you know, defend his actions. And we see the judge just come down on her like a ton of bricks. And I've been in a court. So quick story. I was in court. And matter of fact, it was one time I told you I was rolling my eyes because the case was just that good. The case I had amassed was just that good, just that solid. And the defense was just throwing wild haymakers during trial. But then started just making some wild accusations that the judge had admonished 
this defense attorney over and over again, don't do that. Don't do that. And the judge didn't finally came down and just like, like, oh, okay, so you don't want to listen to what I'm saying. I'm, I'm about to, as he told Chandler, you know, I believe when people play with fire, you got to accept the burns. <laughs> I'm still there. I love that. But it is very uncomfortable, very uncomfortable because these judges don't play. You know, they, in the ones, most judges I've been in front of, you know, they didn't accept bullshit from the cops and they definitely didn't accept bullshit from the attorneys. And this interaction between Chandler and Judge Keeves was a great illustration of when, after the judge has already admonished the, the, the attorneys to stay away from certain fields and don't do certain things, and for you to then go over top of them and still do it, uh, you, get, you, you run the raft of what he did here. And like to the point where Judge Keeves was pretty much intimating that, hey, I'll give you a mistrial if you want it. That brings us to the question of the day. And the question of the day was concerning Bosch and Edgar's interaction and where Bosch had found out that Edgar was the one who betrayed him to Honey Chandler. But I really wanted to focus in on Bosch's ability to forgive. And the question of the day was, to forgive is to set a prisoner free and discover that the prisoner was you. Do you agree, yes or no? And 73% of you agree that forgiving a person really sets you free also. You know, and I can attest to this, especially when it comes to law enforcement. Because again, we all make mistakes. And, and again, Harry had pretty much said the same, said that Edgar had betrayed himself. And maybe that was punishment enough because he's going to live with that because as Honey Chandler has set, shown, she has no problem, I believe, in pulling Edgar's strings. But in police work, you can't do this job without people you, can, you can't trust. Now, I, I, knowing Harry so far, I don't think he will ever forget what um, Edgar did. But I think even he says it here to learn from it. Harry takes on the responsibility of teaching Edgar and learn from this. Learn from the fact that, dude, you cannot give up your trust. And maybe this wasn't as bad as it could have been. So you got off on it a little bit. So learn from it. Don't do it again. And let's move on. And you see how free Edgar and Harry was after they after Harry pretty much forgave them. You see how free and light, you know, they fell back into their roles again. And again, when that happened to me, I can attest to that because you do miss that levity, that interaction with someone on the department because it's very important. You can't do this job without having someone who you can some, some way, somehow trust. And we have seen that Edgar and Bosch did have a relationship and or do have a relationship. And so, as the statement said, I think Bosch was set free just as much as he set Edgar free. So, thank you so much for everyone participating into um, in this poll. Your interactions, again, keep me fueled and I think keeps this podcast ever evolving and ever growing. And if you guys disagree with what I said, I mean... 73% of you agreed, but there was a 27% who didn't. Um, if you agreed or didn't agree, if you can, you know, give me some feedback on what you think, and maybe I'm missing a point, or missing the point, or a point, excuse me. I'm really interested in what you have to say in your opinion, so yeah, hit me up if you want to comment further, or if I missed the mark. So again, thank you, thank you, thank you, and back to Hitting the Streets. Like 
like I said before in an earlier podcast concerning this book, The Concrete Blonde, right now we have two books going on the third book and some of the continuity that is present that Michael has already established. And one of the things that I love, the continuity, is the name of the task force. You know, now we have, remember before, if your unit or operations that you were working with didn't have a, some sexy name, your unit wasn't shit. I mean, I think we talked about that in the Black Echo. So now we have the follower task force. You know, <laughs> you know again, Michael Connolly is true to what he said in earlier book. And again, it goes back to that continuity that I like that Michael Connolly has established with um, Harry Bosch character. And like I said before, I've worked on task forces and they usually fall into two type of groups or working groups. And right now, I've, like one time I worked on a task force and we operated pretty much out of a coat closet. <laughs> we were cramped in there. We were all like, we were all like, what the hell is going on? I mean, this is such a small room. And then I've also worked on a task force where just like here, you're at pretty much uh, your headquarters right beside the chief's office and you got every asset available to the police department to solve the crime. And there's something to say about both because the, fir- the first one, you're pretty much out there on your own a little bit. I mean, there's a task force that's a simile of people and assets and you can, you're more free willing and you like, you probably have a Lieutenant, maybe a captain running it, but here you got the chief running it. And I don't know to me, well, Irving's on up and up on this one. So if Irving's on up and up, give me on this particular instance, give me the one, give me the task force that's working out of Parker Center because then if I ask for it, it's not going to be any hesitation. Really quickly, I'm going to get the, the tools to do the job. And like I said in the question of the day, we see Edgar and Bosch are lighter after Bosch has forgiven um, Edgar. And Edgar also asked Bosch, again, Bosch is the always teaching. He's teaching Edgar. Edgar asked Bosch, you know, I discussed, I had to keep going to more about certain aspects of the pornography uh, field. Do you agree with me? And Harry says, yeah, I, I agree with you because you, you, you're going to have to do that. Because if you don't do it, then he might become suspicious. But, you know, we have to play it close because if we give him too much information, then and he is the follower that he knows we're on the trail of a, of a um, potential witness. But that's the delicate balance you have to work or you have to be when you investigate law enforcement or your peers, because they are, they know the rules. They know the inside of the, the system just as well as you do. And so you have to play it close, but you have to play it close to the vest, but you also have to understand who your particular your particular target is. He's a cop. And if a cop knows what you know and know how you should proceed, then you have to be careful. Now, a great example of this, what I mean by be careful, Michael Connolly showed us in the last book, In the Black Ice, because Calexico was able to use police procedures and policies against uh, Irving and the criminal investigators. And again, that's why I like this continuity, because so Michael Connolly has taught you, you have to be careful when you are investigating police because they know just as much as you do. And again, he gave that great example of what happened in the Black Echo. And, you know, we see Bosch and Edgar joke about Rollenberg's use of the codes on surveillance. Now, if you remember doing the very first podcast of the Black Echo, I told you that I like codes. And I have to admit, <laughs> listeners, I was the Roland Berger of surveillance. Everyone always made, because I, I like codes. I told you that before. And I would go across the radio. I was very efficient and very proper when you come to the codes and maintaining radio etiquette and afterwards doing our after action. So most of the time, after you do a surveillance, everyone's, you, you should do a round robin and you talk about the surveillance, what you did good, what you did wrong. Did I miss anything? Get, um, you accumulate all the notes that people gathered during the surveillance, blah, 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 whatever, whatever. <laughs> so afterwards, doing a round robin, 
you know, we would go and talk about what we uh, did or saw or whatever. And everybody always said, dude, do you really have to be that regimented on the radio? And I would always say, well, I didn't think I was that regimented. And they were like, yeah, do you were. Could you tone it down a little bit? It is a surveillance. It's, it's, it's a criminal, yes, but tone it down. <laughs> so I was the brunt of the dro- joke that Harry and Edgar are talking about here. And then we see Harry asking Edgar about Vice and is Vice following up or helping out with their investigations. Again, remember I told you before, I worked a lot of cases with homicide because a lot of, because I was in narcotics, a lot of homicides were narcotic related. So it only made sense that Vice or narcotics would work with homicide to solve particular cases. And again, this is just one other marker that Michael Connolly has penetrated the world of law enforcement because that happens all the time. Homicide will call advice to say, hey, look, I got this going on. I need your expertise. I need your help. What do you think? What should we do? What should we look for? And so after Edgar and Bosch talk, Bosch gets a page from Moore and he has to go see him. You know, he goes to see him and Moore pretty much gives Bosch four more or some more possible victims of the follower. But let me back up a little bit. Let me back up. One of the things that happens before Moore gives Bosch his information is, again, how I was just saying how observant cops are. You know, Moore has been around for a while. He's a detective. He's a D3, just like Harry. And Moore was out to lunch, and he saw, he actually peeped out the surveillance team, the RHD guys. And Moore knows Something's not right. Why are these guys from, R- from RHD all the way down here in my area? Hmm. So he goes to him and, you know, they're talking. He said, oh, we, we came to get this burrito. You know, we heard so many great things about this burrito. A good, a good fast move, but we know that's not true. So you have to, and that just goes back to what I was just saying. When you're investigating cops, you got to be extra careful because they know just as much as you know. They know the policies and procedures as much as you do. So that just proves that you also have to be extra careful. So like I said, Moore runs down the additional possible victims and he calls them uh, Snow Whites. And, you know, they all look the same. Um, you know, blonde hair, very voluptuous. Um, they all have the same appearance. And it seems to be that they are disappearing every six to seven months. And Bosch then after this interaction with Moore, he kind of then says he looked into um, he looked into Moore's eyes, and he thought he saw the eyes of a killer, which I thought, ooh boy. Again, not to say that Harry's jumping to conclusions, but I think Harry is already leaning towards we got the right guy here. Now we just got to prove it. So after the meeting with Moore, Bosch, you know, he says he's pushing it, you know, because remember the judge had given everyone to be only 15 minutes away from court. And I'll tell you right now, that 15-minute leash, if you break it, again, if you break that 15-minute leash, the judge will come down on you hard. And so for us, um, most judges, like I think they gave us maybe half an hour. I think not 15 minutes. I, I remember a half an hour from the time that the jury or the judge want to call everyone back. I think you had a half an hour. And, and I remember it being a half an hour because back then the court personnel, you know, had everyone's pager numbers and that you had to page, get the page and that, you know, you knew the court, the clerk's office or the clerk's, you know, extension. So you didn't have to call them back. You knew that's they were calling you to come back to court. So Harry takes a chance and says, well, look, I'm going to um, UCLA to talk to Dr. Locke. And because he wants to run down some of the new leads and some of the new information that Moore has given him. And then, again, could Moore possibly be the, uh, the follower? But, you know, what I picked up was how Michael Connolly described Locke's building. Because Locke is an a author and all this kind of stuff, you know. And, but he is in the basement building of the psychology building. And... So now you're starting to get a picture of Dr. Locke. So after 
Bosch tells Dr. Locke what they have and how they're focusing in on a uh, cop. Dr. Locke asks, hey, could I go on surveillance with you? And now we're starting to see, and even Harry is questioning that Dr. Locke's motives are not pure. I mean, because he even says, hey, boy, this would be great because it can get me out of this damn dungeon here. You're like, oh, wow, did I make a mistake? And as a criminal investigator, as, I've, as we talked about, like in the Black Echo, you have to then pull in civilian expertise to solve a crime. And you hope that the civilian is vetted and they have pure intentions to help law enforcement out. But sometimes their help comes at a price and they're trying to advance their own financial or their own career. And you have to always guard against that. But one of the things that Dr. Locke does help Harry realize is that for the follower to last so long in between killings, he has to have trophies so he can relive the event over and over again. That helps stretch out the killings. And so then that puts an idea in Harry's head. So interacting with Dr. Locke is very helpful. But one thing Dr. Locke did say is that he believes the follower is at the end of his killing cycle, that he might be out there on the prowl looking for another victim. And again, you know, once again, Dr. Locke then goes back into, maybe I can really help you out here, Harry. I can really help you out with this, you know, um, looking for these trophies. Can I go with you type of thing? And Harry says, forget about it. And again, I think Harry just might not depend on Dr. Locke as much as he thought he was going to be able to. And we finish up chapter 24 with Dr. Locke telling Harry, you know, that he authored a book on pornography. And Harry notices that he had a, a couple of books on the shelf, but he didn't offer to give Harry. He told Harry, yeah, go to the bookstore and buy it yourself. And again, Harry says, well, maybe that was his backhanded way to get back at Harry for not letting him be more involved in the police um, operation. And that gets us to this episode's Everyone Counts or No One Counts. And my Everyone Counts or No One Counts person for chapters 21 through 24 of The Concrete Blonde is Harry Bosch. And the reason I picked Harry this time around is because he shows us, at least he shows me, his ability to forgive and the power or the power of forgiving a person can have. To give you a little insight about me, listeners, I have difficulty with forgiving. And I remember reading this book back in when I back in the 90s, early 90s or mid 90s. And I remember his ability to forgive Edgar. And I was like, wow, that was really powerful. Again, that's why I like Michael Conley's books. I mean, because they're entertaining, but they they have so many life lessons in them too. And that's what I like about Michael Conley and I like about the character Harry Bosch. So the fact that Harry could forgive Edgar after Harry after Edgar betrayed him as he used using Harry's own uh, language, I thought was really, even though it's fictional, but I can see it happening. Again, I just talked about it. So Again, my everyone counts or no one counts for chapters 21 through 24 of The Concrete Blonde is Harry Bosch. This 
concludes chapters 21 through 24's review of The Concrete Blonde. And again, I always got to say thank you, thank you, thank you for all the listeners, for you promoting the podcast, you know, for you telling your friends and family about what's going on. Again, it's, I know you guys are doing it because I look at the numbers and I see we're growing and growing and growing. And I like the steadiness in which we're growing because I'm trying to get better, like I told you before, when I first started this thing. And just to go down the list, you know, again, you can find us on Apple, Google, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And again, you do it already, but I have to keep asking why you're there. Please rate me five stars or better. And leave your comments. I like the interaction. I like your comments. I like your feedback. And any comment, big or small or little, I'd like to hear about them. So please, please, please continue to leave comments and participate in the question of the day. And also, don't forget, you can join us at www.thethinbluelinepod.com for more investigative content concerning Michael Conley and Harry Bosch. Now, what I mean by that is what I try to do is as I'm reviewing these chapters and something comes up, like if Michael writes about a particular artist or a particular musician, I try to find that um, in put it in the blog or on the website so that you can see exactly what Michael Conley is talking about. Because I know I do that. I did it. So when he make a reference to Cap Calloway or something like that, I would then go look up Cap Calloway and see exactly what Michael Conley was, his mindset was when he actually wrote that particular reference in this um, book. So next time up on The Thin Blue Line, we will take a deep dive into Concrete Blonde, chapters 25 through 28. I'm Phil Parker, and on 107 for the remainder, 